book of Daniel, chapter 12, verse 1, the Bible predicts that there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation even to that time. That's what's coming. That's what's ahead of us. And God wants to teach us how to get through big troubles right now. And if he can accomplish that, and if we can learn the lessons we need to learn, then we'll be more prepared to make it through the big trouble that is ahead of us. So that's our topic as in our final episode of Dark Waters. Welcome back to the final fourth part of a four-part series called Dark Waters, where we are uh, looking at tragedy and trial and uh, uh, how to deal when how to deal with life when terrible things happen, how to trust in God and not give up, and have Him work with us and help us and see us through. Uh, I'm here with uh, Nancy Hunt and her daughter Heidi, and we have been uh, through the first three programs. We've been talking about. Uh, the terrible, almost unimaginable tragedy of losing a son, Nancy, your son, and Heidi, your brother, uh, in, a, in a canoe accident. And that's why we're calling this Dark Waters, because in a, on a beautiful sunny day, April 18, 2001, on a family outing, uh, the unexpected happened and two canoes tipped over. Uh, you were in one of those canoes, Heidi, and, uh, and your brother, was in another canoe, and he went down and didn't come up. And uh, we've talked about those details with your dad, Nancy, with your husband, Tom. And, uh, and as, as I've, we've been exploring this, and I heard your story, I heard Tom tell the story a couple months ago in a, in a local church as he was directing a bell choir, and he shared the story, the trauma. And uh, I heard that story and asked my wife, because I wasn't there that day, I was watching online, and asked my wife, talk to Tom and see if he's willing to share this uh, publicly, this story, because I thought it was so powerful. And I thought it would help people to hold on to their faith in the midst of uh, some uh, unimaginable tra tragedy. So that's why you're here. Uh, you're here just for this recording event. And uh, Heidi, in the last program, you shared a poem that you wrote about uh, your brother and what happened, and uh, it was very powerful. Appreciate that poem. And if any of you missed that poem, it's in part three, so we're not going to read it again. But uh, in this final program, uh, Tom's done a lot of talking in the previous programs because he was there. Um, you know, he's describing this, and you were there. Nancy was not there, uh, at least in the water, because you were watching uh, the little one. Uh, but you both shared, and so the last program, we want to hear from the ladies. We want to hear from both of you. I'll do my best not to uh, talk that much. And I just want to hear from you uh, what people who are watching this can learn from tragedy and how it can, how, what they can do or not do to help them, to help people to get through uh, dark waters, terrible, terrible events, trials, and uh, tribulations that occur in life. So, um, why don't we start with you, Heidi? And I know you, you told me that uh, you've, you're, you've never been here in Priest River, Idaho, that I know of. You've never been in our property. You, you and your family st uh, slept upstairs in our guest room upstairs. And you told me that the Lord really put a lot on your heart to share with people. You have a list of different things that you want to share. And so, we're all ears. So, uh, what did God put on your heart? And then I want to hear from Nancy as well. Okay, thank you. Yes, and I feel like you mentioned how um, things that are on my heart of how to support someone in a tragedy and also if you are in a tragedy or a trial or whatever it is. Um, I, I shared in the last session how uh, you asked how I felt, you know, with the tragedy of Donald and how my dad was struggling with anger and my mom felt more peace that God was in control. And, and I also, I feel like I had pain, but I did have peace of God's presence. But um, actually, you know, from my heart, I am in the midst of a, a, an experience, a, tra a trial that has um, now surpassed the hardness and the pain of Donald's death. And I want to share not about that, but 
it has brought to my mind things that I want to share to people in those kind of situations because while I had that peace, you know, in that trial, I have not always had that experience. You know, I didn't experience anger from my brother's death, but I haven't experienced that anger now. And one thing I want to say is that that's okay. You know, it's okay to have those hard emotions. Um, I, I'll kind of get to more to that, but I feel like in my experience with Donald, that Bible verse was given to me that morning, you know, and I was clinging to this is a true promise, even though my dad felt like this promise isn't true. Um, but I have recently experienced reading a Bible verse that's supposed to be a beautiful promise. It was Psalms 23, 1 and 2. And rather than bring me peace, it, it brought me pain and brought up anger, like, you know, God, this isn't true. And so I've thought, well, how, how to deal with those kinds of feelings when we feel like the promise isn't true? And can, can you explain a little more about Psalm 23 and, and Psalm what you, 23, what you says, read that uh, you're having a hard time relating to now? Uh, the one where it says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He leads me beside the still waters. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. And, you know, my, at the time when that came to my mind, I was going, you know, having a very, a, a hard struggle with my current situation. And I thought, well, what should I do? And I thought, I should think of a Bible promise. So I thought the first Bible promise that came to my head was Psalms 23, you know, about God being our shepherd. But it did not bring me peace. It, it made it worse almost, you know, because I felt that anger at God of why, um, you know, how is this true? It seems like an untrue promise. It feels very untrue. So, so when David said, you leave me beside the still waters, you, you read that and you were thinking, I don't, that's not happening in my life. Right. right. How is this true? Like, this, is, <laughs> this feels untrue. Like, it, it feels like a broken promise. Yeah, I can totally relate to that. Years ago, I went through a terrible time in my life and I uh, one of the verses that God gave me was Psalm 37, I believe it's verse 7, that says, uh, rest in the Lord and wait patiently for Him. And I thought, I don't have any rest in my life right now. But I still held on to that, that uh, even though I don't have rest now, I'm going to yes. wait patiently for Him and He's going to bring it to pass in His time. Yes. These Bible promises that you're speaking of that don't sometimes seem true. Um, the one in uh, 2 Corinthians 4, 17 and 18, talking about our light affliction right now and not looking at those things which are temporal, but looking at those things which are eternal. It's going to work for us an exceeding weight of glory. And I guess sometimes when you come across those promises, it comes to my mind, I need to believe this mentally, even though I do not feel it. I just, and I guess that's the grasping it by faith. Even though I don't feel it and I can't understand how it's going to work, I just have to mentally say, okay, this is true. That's now, God, right. you take care of the rest. Yeah, and when the time of trouble comes in the future, there's going to be lots of times when we don't feel uh, peace and joy and happiness and the promises of God are just, you know, flowing through us like, right. a, like a happy stream. But we still have to trust in the Word of God no matter what. Yes, and I think... A couple other thoughts very connected to those is that I often, I mean, many of us have ridden in, you know, an airplane, and as you go up, your view of below gets bigger and bigger, and just realizing God's big picture is, you know, thousands or millions of times bigger than the view we get up in an airplane, and if you could just imagine being up in the airplane enough where you could see, you know, a car stuck in traffic and then further down the road an accident takes place, you could imagine that person who's in the, the traffic being angry and upset at this, you know, little trial of being stuck in traffic, not realizing that they were just spared a horrible accident. And so I guess for me, with the, when I have those moments of feeling like the promise isn't true, the feelings say that's not true, and, my, you know, mentally I have to think, well, God is seeing, maybe God sees that accident, maybe this traffic is helping me prevent an accident, or who knows what it is, but God has that big picture. And so when we 
there's a song that's very meaningful, and one of the lines says, when you can't see his hand, trust his heart. And so if we can just hold on in faith to what the Bible has told us over and over, that God is love, and so if we can just hold on, you know, if can, I can even, it's okay to feel angry, but I can just know in my heart, I feel angry, but I know God is love, and somehow this is going to work out. And knowing, I thought too of like, if my best friend was to do something that made me upset, I w wouldn't just, you know, delete her from my friends list because I know who she is. I know that she is a loving person. So I would wait and say, wait, help me understand this. And I think that's sort of like God. We know he, he should be our best friend, or at least, you know, we, we can grow in that. And the Bible has told us who he is. And so rather than, quotes, cut him off when something feels untrue or hurtful, I wouldn't cut my best friend off without, you know, some time to work it out. And so I think trusting that God is who he says he is, even when everything feels crazy. Um, and that's not going to fix it, though. I, I feel like that's important to recognize that it's not going to fix your problem. It's going to still be, it could be excruciatingly, painfully hard still, but it's going to just help you like get through that tough moment where you feel like God's promises have been broken. And I feel like those are things that have helped me when I feel like there's an untrue promise. And I, I guess I wanted to share that, um, you know, when I was asked to come and share, I, I wanted to because I feel like it can be a blessing, but I kind of wrestled in my own heart with how can I share about having a healed heart when right now my heart is breaking. And I felt like last night as I was thinking about, well, what can I share, you know, and, and I, I feel like God gave me peace of how to share and just kind of impressed my mind with a few thoughts that I, I started thinking, well, what if I was in the audience and heard this testimony, you know, how this family got through this this tragedy, their faith is strong, you know, at least two of the people had peace through it and, you know, trusted the promises. What if I was sitting in the audience, you know, in my current situation or going through something broken? I, I could feel almost discouraged, even though we intend for this to be encouraging. What I could feel, you know, people can say things that are all meant well. I've been in situations recently where I go to church and hear this miracle story, which is supposed to be, you know, faith building. But I'm sitting there in the audience thinking, this is hurting me so bad right now because my, I am not having a miracle. And if God could do a little miracle of help someone's van get up the slippery slope, why isn't he doing a miracle for me now? And so I just last night was thinking, well, what if I was in the audience? You know, what if, what if I'm feeling like my faith is, you know, well, that's a great story for the Hunt family, but mm -hmm. my faith, I feel like my faith is almost gone and I'm in a black hole. And I just felt like God, it, he didn't give me another poem, so to speak, but almost in the same way that I felt like God put that poem on my heart. It's, it's a different version of a poem. I think I just want to read a little bit of it, okay. of what I felt came to my mind. And I've already kind of alluded to that of, first off, that God is not afraid of our heart emotions. He's not surprised by them. He's not unprepared for them. And he understands them perfectly. And he cares about them compassionately. And he's going to sit with you through those hard emotions. Um, in Psalms 31, it says, for in my haste, other versions say, in my alarm, I said, I am cut off from before your eyes. Nevertheless, you heard my supplications. And so even if you're experiencing anger or, you know, you're not even crying out in faith, you're saying, God, I feel broken, he is still going to hear you. You don't have to cry out in perfect faith before God will help you. And he's not going to just, you know, He's not going to tell you, oh, just get over it. Why aren't you trusting me? He's going to let you feel those hard feelings, and he's going to sit there with you. And it's because that he's letting you feel those hard emotions. You know, he's not trying to say, oh, you shouldn't be angry, or you should just trust me. He's not saying that. He's letting you feel that. It's because of that that then we can come out 
on the other side with peace in spite of the pain, hope in spite of the darkness. And I, I said, well, what is faith? I feel like faith isn't having, faith is not having no hard emotions. It is not feeling peaceful all the time. And it isn't even standing strong all the time. Sometimes we just have to fall down and cry, but that doesn't mean it's not faith. What I believe faith is, is that faith is the hand that continually reaches out to grasp God's help, even when we don't see it or feel it coming. It's reaching out, knowing that our Heavenly Dad is looking out for us, even when our eyes are blinded by tears. It's crying out to Him, knowing that He understands and answers prayers that are only tears. It's believing that He is safe, to pour out our heart's deepest emotions too. And Psalms 18.6 says, In my distress, I called upon the Lord and cried out to my God. He heard my voice from His temple, and my cry came before Him even to His ears. And so, faith is trusting that He's working out things for us when the pain is hiding us from seeing Him, and it's clinging to the knowledge that God loves you with a love that's stronger than death. And in Psalms 18, 19, it says, He delivered me because He delighted in me. And I thought that was just so beautiful that He delights in me and He does want good for us. And, um... I just felt like I wanted to share that because I have already been in audiences where someone's trying to be encouraging, you know, and I just want people to know that it's okay to even feel like you're in blackness or you don't have faith and God is still there and he's still going to help, help yeah, through that. That's right. Thank you, Heidi. And I, I guess to kind of segue to a few thoughts my mom wanted to share that I resonate with and, and I might chime in, but, um, I have definitely found from Donald and from this current experience that that grief and pain and trial is a very long journey and you don't just get over it uh, and it's different for everyone. You, there's People talk about grief waves. You can be feeling strong and faithful in God in one day and the next day can be crashing down. And And there have been people in our lives that have been very helpful and comforting. And we, I mean, I think almost everyone wants to be helpful, but there have been those who have unknowingly done or said things that are not helpful. And we just wanted to share a few things that, that could maybe help you help someone else, you know, because we all want to be supportive friends. And if I had a friend going through a hard time, I would want to know what's something small I could do that would help them. And I think that's sort of something my mom had and if I have time, I'll share a few thoughts. Yeah, sure. Before, before you do, Nancy, I just want to quickly comment. You know, you talked about the song, uh, Trust His Heart. And, and I just, when you mentioned that and all of this, uh, I just think of how much your family loved, loved, loves Donald. You know, mm -hmm. parents love their children so much. and You love your brother, and I love my family, I love my kids. And, and we need to realize somehow if the Holy Spirit can penetrate us and help us to understand that our God loves us more than parents love their children and siblings love each other. And that faith will help us to get through those dark times that God really does care about me no matter what I see or what I feel. So, Nancy. Right. And right along with that, too, is one of the thoughts I had is that, you know, we always, we can ask, why does God allow evil if he's such a loving God and a God of love. But if we never experience the results of sin, would we hate it? And also there's a text in Job 23.10 that has spoken to me that says, He knoweth the way that I take, and when he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. He is desiring to turn us all into gold. And so he knows, and when gold or silver, one or the other or both, is tried in a fire, it gets hot, it does. but God is there watching, watching that temperature. And so just a couple of things like Heidi was referring to about him relating to people that are going through grief, and it, it will be different for different people, but 
some things that we experience that maybe can help other people in, in helping someone in grief is that uh, the day that we return to the ranger station, waiting to find out what they had found out, we had just gotten out of the car, we were still in the middle of the parking lot, and an individual walked out of the ranger station and just announced, he's gone. And I just felt like, you know, God is so close to us, so we should just be close to people, to just be announcing that, calling that across a parking lot to, to people that are anticipating they don't know what. Um, was very hard, and I don't know what happened to Heidi. You know, she went one way, I guess, I did another. I don't know. There, I, there were friends there. It was a couple, uh, a couple from the, the school we worked at, actually two of them, I think, and I remember, I think one person just enveloped me in a hug and one with in you, and they walked us in, and I mean, that, it was, again, it was someone just being there right, right by us that right. hugged but the, us. But the just... It felt insensitive to just kind yeah. of announce something like that. And then when we were in a church, I mean, it's true. And once again, I know that it was being announced to help us. But we were there and the pastor was announcing to the congregation, it's going to take this family three to five years to recover from that. And he was doing it in good stead. But once again, being sensitive to how that's going to affect someone grieving. And I was sitting there thinking, oh, I'm not going to survive three to five years. So you guys aren't going to have to worry about me because I won't even be here. How would I? And I thought about him every day, thought about Donald every day for two years. And the first day when I realized I had not thought about him the day before, I was full of remorse. So how can we be sensitive to people in grief? How can we just be there for them and pray about or think through what we say to them? And yet at the same time, one other thing is to to not ignore them. My sister told me that in talking to me after the death of our son, that she gained a valuable lesson in the fact that most people who lose someone want to talk about that person. They miss them and they're still in their hearts. And many people are afraid to talk to them about the individual that they lost, feeling that it's either gonna cause them to you know, break into tears, which is not necessarily bad, they don't want to offend them, but my sister has said that many times since then, she has approached people who lost someone and said, would you want to talk about them? And they have wanted to because no one has approached them and allowed them to talk. So I guess just saying, ask God how you can reach out to people that are grieving. What is the most sensitive thing to say or not to say to yeah. encourage them? I think, yeah, along that lines, you know, I the kind of the, I think coming at it from an attitude, realizing um, different people are different. So people, some people, I have experienced as well, being, you know, dying to talk about it, but not feeling like I could unless someone asked me. And so I think asking questions can be good, but there, there are people who might, that could cause pain to because grief does affect different people differently. And so, you know, for me, what I try to do is just say, you know, I'm here for you. Would you like to talk? You know, I'm happy to listen. Or I'm also just happy to sit here and let you cry on my shoulder. Or So just being very gentle with the approach. You know, don't, don't ignore. And I know people aren't trying to be mean when they, quotes, ignore you. But I think it's easy and it's understandable where you feel you don't know how to help them. And you feel uncomfortable. You don't want to hurt them. So you just don't. And I think... Um, I do have another friend who's grieving a loss of a brother. And for both of us, at least, you know, when someone can check on you, they remember, I now try to remember the date she lost her brother, his birthday. And I just try to text her, call her, say, you know, I'm thinking of you. I know this is a hard day, you know, just because I remember for me um, with Donald, we had tons of initial support, but as the year went on, you know, people go back to their lives. And for us, we weren't back to our lives. And so just remembering, you know, don't announce it to them. It's going to take you years. Like that was hurtful, but just checking in on them and, you know, try to remember those dates and very gentle approaches and not, not at all, you know, well, don't ever try to tell someone you should do this or this will help you because if you're in grief, you need space to grieve how you want and know someone's there with you. And, and just also, I want to encourage 
listeners to to share your stories, both your rescue stories and your pit stories. You know, share stories where God did rescue you, but but share when you didn't feel rescued because we need to hear both of those. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, like I shared before, you can <laughs> be feeling... I have listened to rescue stories right now, and they've been painful, not because it's not a good story, but because I don't feel rescued. And so to hear someone else telling me, look, I'm not feeling rescued right now, but God is with both of us. Um, I think it's important to share both yeah. our rescue yeah. and our and our deep water. It's story. good, yeah. Jesus healed a lot of people, but Paul left Trophimus sick in Miletus. There's in, I think it's in 2 Timothy where Trophimus was sick and he wasn't healed. So there are stories in the Bible and in our lives where God does miraculously heal somebody, takes away their smoking habit and it's gone. Other people, he doesn't. And uh, we need to learn from Scripture to trust in God, whether the miracle happens right away or whether it doesn't. And He's Hebrews, still there with us. Hebrews 11 has helped me a lot with that because it is so easy to look at someone else and feel like, why do they have that? And I don't. Hebrews 11 talks about miracle stories, but at the end it says, others, you know, through faith endured, you know, death and all these horrible... So just because you have faith... Like, it can look different, but God is still the same. Amen. Well, appreciate so much, both of you being here and, uh, and your husband. And we're going to wind this up. <clears throat> I'll go back to Isaiah 53, or 43. Isaiah 43, verse 2 says, When you pass through the waters, those dark waters, God says, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. And verse 5 says, Fear not, for I am with you. And what we all need to learn in these traumatic days, these days of trouble and trials, is to get familiar with God's Word and to learn to trust Him in darkness and in the light, when things are going good and when they're not. And if we do that, God will bring us through. He'll bring us through to the other side. We need to hold on to our faith. And someday God will make it all up to us and we'll live in a land where there's no more death, sin, sorrow, or pain. So let's be there. We hope you enjoyed this video. Before you go, check out these wonderful books for sharing. The Truth About the Sabbath is packed with information for anyone wanting to understand the Sabbath subject. Also, the 666 beast identified. What it means to you identifies both the beast and his strange number 666. What do the beast and his number have to do with you? Both are available in paperback and ebook versions from Whitehorse Media. We hope you've been blessed by this White Horse Media production. To support White Horse Media, please call us at 1-800-78-BIBLE. That's 1-800-782-4253. You may also send your donations by mail to White Horse Media, PO Box 130, Priest River, Idaho, 83856, or donate online at whitehorsemedia.com. And now for some breaking news, White Horse Media has just launched its new free online Bible school, Thunder in the Holy Land, filmed in Israel to help you and others discover the true teachings of God's Word. To learn more, visit whitehorsemediabibleschool.com. You'll be glad you did.